this new year, we cry out to you, the one who restores broken hearts, who refreshes tired spirits, who makes all things new. Let our faith and hope be born again today. Help us to let go of the past, stop looking back and turn our eyes toward you. We are here today in full acceptance of who we've been, but also in hopeful expectation of who you're shaping us to be. Let your love work in us so you can better work through us. We stand ready, ready to embrace all you have for our lives, ready to do your will, ready to witness the wonders of your mighty hand, ready to share the redeeming love, the perfect grace, the life-changing salvation you have given us. So today, we lift up our voices in praise to the one who washes away our failures, who wipes away our fear and doubt, to the almighty God who makes all things new. Hello and welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. We are so glad that you're here and for those of you who might be newer, we would love to connect with you. And a great way you can do that is by heading to our website at walkiechurch.life. This is a great place for all of us to take those next steps. And please don't forget to follow us and engage socially on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Those are great ways to share Jesus with others. Today, we are in the great 50 days of Easter and our worship series, It's a Brave New World. After Jesus' resurrection, we have new opportunities to interject Jesus Christ into the conversations we have in the world. Pastor John Luke was back preaching last week. He's fine, but he's on vacation today, so Pastor John Augsburger is stepping in again today. He's the one who first stepped in to preach for us right after Pastor John's stroke. And of course, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all moms. Today we will pray for moms and for all women later in the service. Also please consider sharing this video. It is a great way to share Jesus with others. Welcome. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's desperate for some healing let me tell you about my
Hi, folks. The scripture for the morning comes from the book of Acts, and it's the 17th chapter, verses 18 to 29. And in this scripture, Paul is walking around the city of Athens, Greece, and he's been... Um, well, if you know Paul, you know that he can't just keep his mouth shut about things that has happened to him. Everywhere he goes and everyone he encounters, he's, he tells this about this event that happened to his life on the road to Damascus, that he, his eyes were once blind, but now he sees, and this Jesus who he had once persecuted came to him. And this is the same thing he's doing here in Athens. He just can't help it. And so he's in Athens and he's meeting people and going to the marketplaces. And this is where we pick up the scripture for the morning. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this pretentious babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like you to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and I looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made with human hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needs anything, since he himself gives to all mortal life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all people to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps fumble about for him and find him though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some even of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, you're not superstitious, are you? I mean, just think about it. We live in this incredible age of scientific discoveries. We, we have so many advancements. Uh, astrophysicists, easy for you to say, astrophysicists have mapped the curve of the universe and they're looking into black holes. We have... Uh, mapped also the human genome. We're beginning to do that so that we think that we can, might discover um, cures for diseases on a, on a cellular level or, or below. We have these tiny little minuscule machines called nanotechnology that can do amazing things. We know more about the hows and whys of things than we've ever known before. So how is it that in 2008, when they were building the new Yankee Stadium. Anybody follow baseball? In 2008, a $1.3 million project was brought to a screeching halt. It seems like one of the construction workers who was an unrepentant Red Sox fan had taken a David Ortiz jersey, a Red Sox player, and had buried it in the cement floor of the Yankees locker room in an effort to curse the Yankees. And one of the other construction workers, who was a Yankee fan, had, had heard about this plot and saw it happening, and he went to the contractor and said, you know, I don't want to be the cause of the Yankees' downfall, uh, but there's a jersey implanted in the floor of the Yankees' locker room 
and it's a Red Sox jersey. jersey. The guy wanted to curse the Yankees. So con construction halted. 50, it cost $50,000 to stop construction that day as they went in and jackhammered the floor and removed that David Ortiz Red Sox jersey to keep the Yankees from being cursed because someone believed in the jinxing power of a piece of cloth buried in concrete. Surely no one's superstitious. No one knocks on wood or throws spilled salt over their shoulder or surely you can resist reading your horoscope. You never even notice when Friday the 13th comes around, do you? No one would think t twice about buying the house of, a, of, a, of where you knew that a crime, a major crime or a murder had, had taken place. That wouldn't bother you. Or having a cornea transplant of a known criminal. You see, no matter how much we know about the world that we live in and the physical reality is never enough. The human spirit believes that there's always something more to be revealed, that there's something more out there than just what we can handle and see and touch and manipulate. It's, we want to lift the veil to see beyond the, the thin places that separate us from a, another reality. Paul's speech to the Athenians gathered at the Areopagus was designed to get his audience thinking about that inner yearning for something more, this groping for an unknown God. He tells them things like, the God who created the universe, who gave life to human beings, does not live in shrines that are made with human hands. He says, God is no image formed in the art and imagination of mortals. He refers even back to Isaiah when Isaiah said things like, you cut down a tree from the forest and you bring it into your house and you chop it up and part of it you use for firewood and to cook your, your, uh, your food and part of it you warm your, your house with. Some of it you make furniture to sit on or to eat at a table. And the rest of it, the, the, maybe some of the parts that weren't fit for furniture or firewood, you, you form into some kind of an idol that you put in a shrine and then you worship that. Silliness. But then he says, you poor Athenians, poor, poor Athenians. You think that the only God of worship has to be seen and touched and put on some pedestal. Not only that, they think that because their culture is the center of the universe, travel and trade and industry and government, that because the whole world flows through and to their streets, they have surely been exposed to all the truth that ever was from all the four corners of the world. It has now met in this great culture of Greece. So in an effort to embrace it all, they take it all in. Every foreign philosophy that sounds good to the ears, every foreign religion that doesn't preach an uprising against Rome, every image of every God that can sit on a pedestal and be honored and worshiped from a distance without compromising their true gods of wealth and knowledge and power. Every religion that offers convenience over sacrifice and pleasure over devotion, they're all welcome in Athens. Not only that, <laughs> they hedge their bets and just in case there was any of the gods that they might have missed, they had this shrine or this altar to an unknown god. And so Paul walks through the city, and I'm sure he noticed all the great diversity of Athens and its worship. And Paul also went, Paul also went to the marketplaces, and these were the centers of the economy and political debate. They were the cultural center and life of Athens. It was there that Paul engaged the Athenians about religion. He says, you the Athenians, you really are a religious group, aren't you? I'm not sure he meant it as a compliment. Haven't you ever said about somebody or heard about somebody that, oh, they're very religious. In our day and in our culture, 
I'm not sure I want to be known as religious. I've heard folks described as being religious in the worst way, and usually what that means is they're almost superstitious about how they practice their faith. I've met people whose religion is more of, about a sense of shoulds and oughts than a, a joyful relationship to God. Paul says that the God who made the universe, full of black holes and nanotechnology and genomes, those are my words, he said the God who made the universe can't be enshrined by human hands, particularly the hands that this God had made. God is more than you can figure out and put in a box, but yet God gives breath and life to everyone and everything. God is just that close. We all come from this one God and we all go back to this one God because we're all created in the image of this one God. Not only that, God has put in our hearts a yearning for God so that we could reach out for God and, and find God. Pascal had said something like, we have this God-shaped hole in our lives. And most of the time we try to cram, cram in all the kinds of things that don't fit there to satisfy. But Paul said that this God is never far away. In fact, we live and move and we have our very dwelling in this God that we cannot see or touch with our hands, nor can we put this God in a box or a pedestal. This was the start of Paul's sermon at the Areopagus. And I think Paul had him right in the palm of his hand. Have you met this, this God? This, have you encountered this unknown, unseen, unconfined God? <clears throat> I remember the the first prayer, I'll put it this way, the first real adult prayer I ever prayed in my life. Do you? Oh, not, not the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, or God is good, God is great. Not our Father who art in heaven. But I mean a real gut-wrenching prayer from the depths of my heart. And I think it was someone who said, that there are only two kinds of prayers. One is, help me, help me, help me. And the other is, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, this was a help me, help me, help me prayer. I'm sure your first adult prayer was not like mine. Your prayer, first to prayer as an adult, was more other-centered than self-centered more concerned with deepening your relationship with God than getting out of a jam like mine was. I was in college and I, <laughs> I had just had a failed relationship. And you know, this was really the first heartbreak that I'd ever really had. It was, and it was bad and it, it failed painfully. And I was trying to, to go to classes while I was in college and I was walking down the halls of Baldwin Hall. And I remember I was going through the motions. I, I remember words coming out of my mouth as I was walking along. And, and these words were, were out loud in a, probably a pre-Christian vocabulary that went something like this. I'm tired of this blank. I can't do this anymore by myself. You've either got to change me or you've got to change this situation because I am a blanking mess. And I suddenly became aware that I was no longer alone in that hall. And I don't mean that I suddenly felt overwhelmed by the presence of God and the Holy Spirit and that all my prayers had been answered and I suddenly understand the meaning of life. What I mean is that there were other people walking in the hall with me 
And those words had came out of my mouth in a, larger, a louder than conversational man, uh, voice. And people were looking at me. They were looking at me sadly. And I felt silly. I felt foolish, even a little sacrilegious because of that prayer. Or I didn't even know it, maybe it was a prayer. What was I doing? I wasn't in church. I didn't use the proper words and the phrasings of the prayers that I grew up with in church. I even used some words that I'm sure had never been uttered in a prayer in the church that I grew up in, but I felt like I had just prayed, prayed my first honest prayer of confession and petition. And it helped me. I had always kept God at kind of a distance. This God that I'd always heard about on a pedestal. But that prayer felt good somehow. And from then on until this very day, I think I can pray about anything. Nothing's too big, nothing's too small or trivial. Nothing's too personal or painful or disappointing. I, I pray for parking spots. Here's what I believe today. I believe that there are many people in churches who have put God in a box or a, on a pedestal like the Athenians. We do that, I think, for our own protection we're afraid to let God loose because then we wouldn't be in control. Control is just an illusion, if you hadn't guessed this. If we let God loose, we would have to let God really be God to us. And it's easier to keep God on that pedestal than to allow God to be personal and involved. What if God was more than just an object of our worship? Or our music. We want to define the boundaries of God's activity rather than let God be the God and break down those walls. We kind of like the old superstitions rather than the new reality of a, a God who challenges us to, and takes us to places that we would never go on our own. Here's what else I believe today. I believe that God on a pedestal is easier than a God who is as close as your next breath. We do have a sense of less control of our lives if we really let God flow through us and live through us. Because a living God challenges us, demands devotion and action to our faith. And that's tough. But if you think that's tough, then try going through a separation or, or divorce without a sense that the God who knew you before you had a heart to break was standing right beside you, still loves you. And then go ahead and run to Jesus. If you think that the life of faith is strenuous, then try driving home from the doctor's office just after you've heard the C word. And then with, with an unconverted vocabulary, you pour out your heart out to a God who is the great physician. And then go ahead and cry to Jesus. If you think that this life of faith and the disciplines of giving and serving are just too much and that giving to any cause or, or serving people who you don't even know is just a waste of your time and money, then go home and put good locks on your doors, build up your walls high and, and build that altar to wealth and security really high and gather around you all the comforts that you can. 
But if there is more, and if you can move over your sense of needing to know and needing to control, then a new sense of wonder and awe and reverence for this life can be yours. The last little bit of Paul's sermon was that there is an assurance that these things are true and that assurance is that God had raised one from the dead and promises to do that over and over. You see, all the efforts to contain God had failed. They put God in a holy of holies barricaded by a great curtain. And that curtain was torn from top to bottom and God was set free. They tried to nail Christ to a tree. And the cross in which they raised him couldn't contain him, neither could the tomb. Now Christ has been set free in our hearts by faith. He is set free to meet you at every step of your life. And that's, that's a brave new world. Amen. I invite your prayer with me at this time. In the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to God. Almighty God, we pray for all who search for you. May they find their way in you. Bless us with lips that sing your praise and lives that tell the stories of all that you have done for us. Open our eyes to find you among us as we share your love with others. Lord, we have too many prayers to lift to you that cast our hearts in dark places. Prayers for victims of senseless and hate-driven violence. Prayers for lost confidence in our government leaders. Prayers for survivors of earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, and natural disasters. Prayers for those under the burden of continued warring and fighting. Prayers for safety, protection, and security for all of your children. So many of these prayers alone can be divisive and alienating depending on our individual biases and perspectives. But today, I pray you will take all these concerns from us and help us instead unite our prayers around the common theme of motherhood. Our prayers are especially personal for me, having a caring biological mother, a kind mother welcomed through marriage, my loving wife being blessed as a mother of three wonderful unique children, and one of those children who is now herself also a mother. Will you join me in praying for all these people we call mother? Those who gave birth this year to their first child and two families in our congregation. Those who lost a child this year. Those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains. Those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away. Those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment. Those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms. Those who have warm and close relationships with their children. And those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with their children. Those who lost their mothers this year. Those who experienced abuse at the hands of their own mother. Those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood those who are single and long to be married and mothering their own children, and those who step-parent, those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, and those who all have emptier nests in the upcoming year, those who place their children up for adoption, those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising. Let us pray for all these, and now for ourselves, our families, and those we love, especially all whom we lift up to you, Lord, silently on our hearts and minds. Holy God, bless us with the gift of faith that we may know you and love you and enjoy life eternal shared with you, for blessed are you, loving God. We give you thanks that you have placed in our hearts, in the hearts of your faithful people, the gift of faith and the desire to share Jesus with others in this world. We offer this through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Hello, thank you for connecting with us. Here are some next steps for our faith journey. We are doing a ribbon cutting with the Waukee Area Chamber of Commerce. The event will be Thursday, May 25th, with an open house starting at 4 p.m., a ceremony at 4.30 p.m., and tours happening until about six. If you are willing to help greet, give tours, or serve light appetizers and drinks, please contact Cindy Krigmau or the church office. Would you be willing to give a ride to someone on a Sunday morning? We are aware of a few people who occasionally need some help getting to and from Sunday worship. Please contact the church office if you are able to help. Save the date. A one-day vacation Bible school is back on Sunday, August 13th. If you would like to volunteer or help plan, please contact Drew Klein or the church office. Either way, stay connected to our social media and email alerts to, for more information. Now that we are taking down chairs after worship so that the multi-ministry center is available during the week, and thank you for helping with that, uh, we also need to set the chairs up on Sunday mornings for worship. Would you be willing to help us do that? Miranda Carone is currently leading the chair setup, but we're also hoping to have a few others who could lead as well. If you're willing to lead or serve on Sunday mornings for chair setup, please contact Miranda Crone or the church office. Finally, you're welcome to give an offering today in person in the offering box located just outside the sanctuary doors or our website, walkiechurch.life or directly through the Realm app. Thank you for your support of the mission and ministry of this church. I'm Michaela Craigmile. I'm the administrative assistant here. You can contact me in the office at any time and please don't forget to like, follow and subscribe on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>